The Battle of Adwa was the climactic battle of the First Italo-Ethiopian War. The Ethiopian forces defeated the Italian invading force on Sunday March 1, 1896, near the town of Adwa. The decisive victory thwarted the campaign of the Kingdom of Italy to expand its colonial empire in the Horn of Africa. By the end of the 19th century, European powers had carved up almost all of Africa after the Berlin Conference, only Ethiopia and Liberia still maintained their independence. Adwa became a preeminent symbol of Pan-Africanism and secured Ethiopian sovereignty until the Second Italo-Ethiopian War 40 years later. In 1889, the Italians signed the Treaty of Wachel with the then King Menelik of Shua. The treaty, signed after the Italian occupation of Eritrea, recognized Italy's claim over the coastal colony. In it, Italy also promised to provide financial assistance and military supplies. A dispute later arose over the interpretation of the two versions of the document. The Italian language version of the disputed Article 17 of the treaty stated that the Emperor of Ethiopia was obliged to conduct all foreign affairs through Italian authorities, effectively making Ethiopia a protectorate of the Kingdom of Italy. The Amharic version of the article, however, stated that the Emperor could use the good offices of the Kingdom of Italy in his relations with foreign nations if he wished. However, the Italian diplomats claimed that the original Amharic text included the clause and that Menelik II knowingly signed a modified copy of the treaty. The Italian government decided on a military solution to force Ethiopia to abide by the Italian version of the treaty. As a result, Italy and Ethiopia came into confrontation, in what was later to be known as the First Italo-Ethiopian War. In December 1894, Bata Hagos led a rebellion against the Italians in Akele Guzai, in what was then Italian-controlled Eritrea. Units of General Orest Baratieri's army under Major Pietro Toselli crushed the rebellion and killed Bata. The Italian army then occupied the Tigrayan capital, Adwa. In January 1895, Baratieri's army went on to defeat Ras Mangesha Johannes in the Battle of Kodit, forcing Mangesha to retreat further south, by late 1895. Italian forces had advanced deep into Ethiopian territory. On December 7, 1895, Ras Makoen Wolde Michael, Fiterary Gabehu and Ras Mangesha Johannes commanding a larger Ethiopian group of Menelik's vanguard annihilated a small Italian unit at the Battle of Amba Alagi. The Italians were then forced to withdraw to more defensible positions in Tigray province, where the two main armies faced each other. By late February 1896, supplies on both sides were running low. General Orest Baratieri, commander of the Italian forces, knew the Ethiopian forces had been living off the land, and once the supplies of the local peasants were exhausted, Emperor Menelik II's army would begin to melt away. However, the Italian government insisted that General Baratieri act. On the evening of February 29, Baratieri, about to be replaced by a new governor, General Baldissera, met with his generals Matteo Albert I, Giuseppe Aramondi, Vittorio de Bormida, and Giuseppe Elena, concerning their next steps. He opened the meeting on a negative note, revealing to his brigadiers that provisions would be exhausted in less than five days, and suggested retreating, perhaps as far back as Asmara. His subordinates argued forcefully for an attack, insisting that to retreat at this point would only worsen the poor morale. De Bormida exclaimed, Italy would prefer the loss of two or three thousand men to a dishonorable retreat. Baratieri delayed making a decision for a few more hours. Claiming that he needed to wait for some last-minute intelligence, but in the end announced that the attack would start the next morning at 9 a.m. His troops began their march to their starting positions shortly after midnight. 
Order of Battle Ethiopian Forces Shua, Negus Nagasti King of Kings Menelik II, 25,000 rifles, 3,000 horses, 32 guns, Begemder, Itagi Tedu, 9,000 rifle, 600 horses, 4 guns, Gajam, Negus Tekel Hamanot, 8,000 rifles, 700 horses, Harar, Rasmakoan, 15,000 rifles, Tigray, Rasman Gesha Johannes and Ras Alula, 5,000 rifles, 6 guns, Wallow, Ras Michael, 6,000 rifles, 5,000 horses, Semyon, Ras Guxa Oli, 8,000 rifles, Lasta, Wagsum Gwangal, 6,000 rifles. In addition there were 20,000 spearmen and swordsmen as well as an unknown number of armed peasants. Estimates for the Ethiopian forces under Menelik range from a low of 73,000 to a high of over 120,000, outnumbering the Italians by an estimated five or six times. In addition, the armies were followed by a similar number of camp followers who supplied the army, as had been done for centuries. Most of the army consisted of riflemen, a significant percentage of whom were in Menelik's reserve, however. There were also a significant number of cavalry and infantry only armed with lances, those with lances were referred to as lancer servants. Italian forces, the Italian army consisted of four brigades, totaling 17,978 troops with 56 artillery pieces. However, it is likely that fewer fought in the actual battle on the Italian side, Harold Marcus notes that several thousand soldiers were needed in support roles and to guard the lines of communication to the rear. He accordingly estimates that the Italian force at Adwa consisted of 14,923 effective combat troops. One brigade under General Albert I was made up of Eritrean Ascari led by Italian officers. The remaining three brigades were Italian units under Brigadiers de Bormida, Elena and Aramandi. While these included elite Bersaglieri and Alpini units, a large proportion of the troops were inexperienced conscripts recently drafted from metropolitan regiments in Italy into newly formed D'Africa battalions for service in Africa. Battle on the night of February 29th and the early morning of March 1st, three Italian brigades advanced separately towards Adwa over narrow mountain tracks, while a fourth remained camped. David Levering Lewis states that the Italian battle plan, called for three columns to march in parallel formation to the crests of three mountains, De Bormida commanding on the right, Albert I on the left, and Aramandi in the center with a reserve under Elena following behind Aramandi. The supporting crossfire each column could give the others made the soldiers as deadly as razored shears. Albertone's brigade was to set the pace for the others. He was to position himself on the summit known as Kidana Merit, which would give the Italians the high ground from which to meet the Ethiopians, however, the three leading Italian brigades had become separated during their overnight march and by dawn were spread across several miles of very difficult terrain. Their sketchy maps caused Albert I to mistake one mountain for Kidan Emerit, and when a scout pointed out his mistake, Albert I advanced directly into the Ethiopian positions. Menelik II at the Battle of Adwa Unbeknownst to General Baratieri, Emperor Menelik knew his troops had exhausted the ability of the local peasants to support them and had planned to break camp the next day, March 2nd. The Emperor had risen early to begin prayers for divine guidance when spies from Ras Alula brought him news that the Italians were advancing. The Emperor summoned the separate armies of his nobles and with the Empress Tedu Batul beside him, ordered his forces forward. Negus Tekel Hamanot commanded the right wing with his troops from Gajam, 
Ras Mangesha in the left with his troops from Tigray, Ras Makoan leading the center with his Harari troops, and Ras Michael at the north side leading the Wallo Aramo cavalry. In the reserves on the hills just west of Adwa, were the Emperor Menelik and Empress Taitu, with the warriors of Rasoli and Wags Humgwangal. The Ethiopian forces positioned themselves on the hills overlooking the Adwa Valley, in perfect position to receive the Italians, who were exposed and vulnerable to crossfire. Albertone's Ascari Brigade was the first to encounter the onrush of Ethiopians at 6 o'clock, near Kidan Emerit, where the Ethiopians had managed to set up their mountain artillery. Accounts of the Ethiopian artillery deployed at Adwa differ. Russian advisor Leonid Artemanov wrote that it comprised 42 Russian mountain guns supported by a team of 15 advisors. But British writers suggest that the Ethiopian guns were Hotchkiss and Maxim pieces captured from the Egyptians or purchased from French and other European suppliers. The Ethiopian units closest to Albertone's advanced position on the slopes of the hill of Endakidana Merit first moved to the attack. These included troops under Menelik, Negus Tekul Hamanot, Ras Michael, and Ras Mangasha, while those of Ras Makoan and Ras Oli came up soon after, so a large proportion of the Ethiopian army was soon concentrated against Albertone's isolated Askari brigade. Albertone's heavily outnumbered Ascaris held their position for two hours until Albertone's capture, and under Ethiopian pressure the survivors sought refuge with Aramandi's brigade. Aramandi's brigade beat back the Ethiopians who repeatedly charged the Italian position for three hours with gradually fading strength until Menelik released his reserve of 25,000 shuans and overran the Italian defenders. Two companies of Bersaglieri who arrived at the same moment could not help and were cut down, De Bormida's Italian brigade had moved to support Albert I but was unable to reach him in time. Cut off from the remainder of the Italian army, De Bormida began a fighting retreat towards friendly positions. However, he inadvertently marched his command into a narrow valley where the Wallo Aramo cavalry under Ras Michael slaughtered his brigade. De Bormida's remains were never found, although an old woman living in the area said that she had given water to a mortally wounded Italian officer, a chief, a great man with spectacles and a watch, and golden stars. Two Alpini companies under Baratieri himself were outflanked and destroyed piecemeal on the slopes of Mount Bella by the warriors of Ras Makoan. Menelik watched as Gajam forces under the command of Tekul Hamanot made quick work of the last intact Italian brigade. By noon, the survivors of the Italian army were in full retreat and the main battle was over. The Ethiopian pursuit continued for nine miles until the late afternoon, while local peasants alerted by signal fires killed Italian and Ascari stragglers throughout the night. Immediate aftermath According to Richard Koch the losses of the Italian army were 5,900 killed and 1,000 wounded in the battle and subsequent retreat back into Eritrea, with 1,681 taken prisoner. Brigadiers de Bormida and Aramandi were amongst the dead. Koch records that Ethiopian losses were 3,886 killed and 6,000 wounded. In their flight to Eritrea, the Italians left behind all of their artillery and 11,000 rifles, as well as most of their transport. As Paul B. Hens notes, Baratieri's army had been completely annihilated while Menelix was intact as a fighting force and gained thousands of rifles and a great deal of equipment from the fleeing Italians. The Italian prisoners, who included Brigadier Albert I, appear to have been treated as well as could be expected under difficult circumstances, though about 200 died of their wounds in captivity, however, 800 captured Eritrean Ascari, regarded as traitors by the Ethiopians, had their right hands and left feet amputated. Augustus Wilde records when he visited the battlefield months after the battle, the pile of severed hands and feet was still visible, a rotting heap of ghastly remnants. 
Further, many Askari had not survived their punishment, while writing how the neighborhood of Adwa was full of their freshly dead bodies, they had generally crawled to the banks of the streams to quench their thirst. Where many of them lingered unattended and exposed to the elements until death put an end to their sufferings. There does not appear to be any evidence for reports that some Italians were castrated and these may reflect confusion with the atrocious treatment of the Ascari prisoners. Baratieri was relieved of his command and later charged with preparing an inexcusable plan of attack and for abandoning his troops in the field. He was acquitted on these charges but was described by the court-martial judges as being entirely unfit for his command public opinion in Italy was outraged. Chris Prouty offers a panoramic overview of the response in Italy to the news, when news of the calamity reached Italy there were street demonstrations in most major cities. In Rome, to prevent these violent protests, the universities and theaters were closed. Police were called out to disperse rock throwers in front of Prime Minister Crispy's residence. Crispy resigned on March 9. Troops were called out to quell demonstrations in Naples. In Pavia, crowds built barricades on the railroad tracks to prevent a troop train from leaving the station. The Association of Women of Rome, Turin, Milan and Pavia called for the return of all military forces in Africa. Funeral masses were intoned for the known and unknown dead. Families began sending to the newspapers letters they had received before Adwa in which their menfolk described their poor living conditions and their fears at the size of the army they were going to face. King Umberto declared his birthday, March 14, a day of mourning. Italian communities in St. Petersburg, London, New York, Chicago, Buenos Aires and Jerusalem collected money for the families of the dead and for the Italian Red Cross. The Russian support for Ethiopia led to the advent of a Russian Red Cross mission. The Russian mission was a military mission conceived as a medical support for the Ethiopian troops. It arrived in Addis Ababa some three months after Menelik's Adwa victory. In 1895, Emperor Menelik II invited Leontieve to return to Ethiopia with a Russian military mission. Leontieve organized a delivery of Russian weapons for Ethiopia, 30,000 rifles, 5 million cartridges, 5,000 sabers, and a few cannons. Aftermath Emperor Menelik decided not to follow up on his victory by attempting to drive the routed Italians out of their colony. The victorious emperor limited his demands to little more than the abrogation of the Treaty of Wuchel. In the context of the prevailing balance of power, the emperor's crucial goal was to preserve Ethiopian independence. In addition, Ethiopia had just begun to emerge from a long and brutal famine. Harold Marcus reminds us that the army was restive over its long service in the field, short of rations, and the short rains which would bring all travel to a crawl would soon start to fall. At the time, Menelik claimed a shortage of cavalry horses with which to harry the fleeing soldiers. Chris Prouty observes that, a failure of nerve on the part of Menelik has been alleged by both Italian and Ethiopian sources. As a direct result of the battle, Italy signed the Treaty of Addis Ababa, recognizing Ethiopia as an independent state. This defeat of a colonial power and the ensuing recognition of African sovereignty became rallying points for later African nationalists during their struggle for decolonization, as well as activists and leaders of the Pan-African movement. As the Afrocentric scholar Molef Asante explains, after the victory over Italy in 1896, Ethiopia acquired a special importance in the eyes of Africans and black people all over the world alike, as the only surviving African state that successfully defeated a European colonial power in open battle. Italy's government who had viewed them as an inferior barbaric race were brought to their knees and subsequently forced to recognize the African nation of Ethiopia as an equal. 
After Adawa, Ethiopia became emblematic of African valor and resistance. The bastion of prestige and hope to thousands of Africans who were experiencing the full shock of European conquest and were beginning to search for an answer to the myth of African and black inferiority as well as invoking a strong sense of pan-Africanism towards to people of African-American origins who had suffered equally appalling injustices at the time and many centuries before. On the other hand, many writers have pointed out how this battle was a humiliation for the Italian military. Italian historian Tripodi argued that some of the roots of the rise of fascism in Italy went back to this defeat and to the perceived need to avenge the defeat that started to be present in the military and nationalistic groups of the Kingdom of Italy. Indeed, one student of Ethiopia's history, Donald N. Levine, points out that for the Italians Adwa became a national trauma which demagogic leaders strove to avenge. It also played no little part in motivating Italy's revanchist adventure in 1935. Levine also noted that the victory gave encouragement to isolationist and conservative strains that were deeply rooted in Ethiopian culture, strengthening the hand of those who would strive to keep Ethiopia from adopting techniques imported from the modern West. Present-day Celebrations of Adwa The Adwa Victory Day is a public holiday in all regional states and charter cities across Ethiopia. All schools, banks, post offices and government offices are closed, with the exceptions of health facilities. Some taxi services and public transports choose not to operate on this day. Shops are normally open but most close earlier than usual. The victory of Adwa, being a public holiday, is commemorated in public spaces. In Addis Ababa, the victory of Adwa is celebrated at Menelik Square with the presence of government officials, patriots, foreign diplomats, and the general public. The Ethiopian police orchestra play various patriotic songs as they walk around Menelik Square. The public dress up in traditional Ethiopian patriotic attire. Men often wear jodhpurs and various types of vest, they carry the Ethiopian flag and various patriotic banners and placards, as well as traditional Ethiopian shields and swords called shotel. Women dress up in different patterns of handcrafted traditional Ethiopian clothing, known in Amharic as Habesha Kemis. Some wear black gowns overall, while others put royal crowns on their heads. Women's styles of dress, like their male counterparts, imitate the traditional styles of Ethiopian patriotic women. Of particular note is the dominant presence of the Empress Tata Batul during these celebrations, the beloved and influential wife of Emperor Menelik II. Empress Tata Batul played a significant role during the Battle of Adwa. Although often overlooked, thousands of women participated in the Battle of Adwa. Some were trained as nurses to attend to the wounded, and others mainly cooked and supplied food and water to the soldiers and comforted the wounded, in addition to Addis Ababa, other major cities in Ethiopia including Bahir Dar, Debra Marcos and the town of Adwa itself, where the battle took place, celebrate the victory of Adwa in public ceremonies. Several images and symbols are used during the commemoration of the victory of Adwa, including the tricolored green, gold and red Ethiopian flag, images of Emperor Menelik II and Empress Tata Batul, as well as other prominent kings and war generals of the time including King Tekel Haymanad of Gajam, King Michael of Wallo, Dejazmik Balcha Safo, Fiterary Habt Georgis Dinagdi, and Fiterary Gabehu, among others. Surviving members of the Ethiopian Patriotic Battalions were the various medals that they collected for their participation on different battlefields. Young people often wear t-shirts adorned by Emperor Menelik II, Empress Tatu, Emperor Haile Selassie and other notable members of the Ethiopian monarchy. Popular and patriotic songs are often played on amplifiers. 
Of particular note are Ejigea Shibaba's ballad dedicated to the Battle of Adwa and Teddy Afro's popular song, Te Kurso, which literally translates to Black Man or Black Person, a poetic reference to Emperor Menelik II's decisive African victory over Europeans, as well as the Emperor's darker skin complexion.